Hi, my name is Barbara Whitlock. I serve as humanities coordinator as well as upper school history and English teacher at the Montrose School in Medfield, Massachusetts. I also do research through um, my study with the UK Jubilee Center for Character Education, particularly focused on the role of relationships informing adolescents for practical wisdom. This talk emerges out of my work at Montrose School, my work as a teacher, my work as a researcher, as a mentor, and as a speaker who has helped um, facilitate courageous conversations in our community about issues related to race and politics. I do this in the classroom as well as um, in the broader community, um, our school community. We have um, two podcasts that reflect some of these ideas, one about the recent U.S. election and one about talking about race. These are available on the Montrose website under our podcast, montroseschool.org. Today, I want to talk about how to cultivate the virtues of charity and courage through dialogue with our children and students. That as Christians, we play a role that we must model civic virtue for the common good. The contentious political climate surrounding the recent U.S. presidential election is testimony to a global trend in democratic societies where political polarization inflamed by social media, these notification formulas that keep everyone churned, particularly adolescents, as the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, reveals, and through opinion-based news organizations that Arthur C. Brooks calls the outrage industrial complex in his 2019 book, Love Your Enemies. These influences make engaging in the public square feel more like a war zone than a stage for reflective debate in free societies. For Christians, this climate offers two sometimes contradictory options. One is engage fully in the conversation with the temptation of adding to the vitriolic rhetoric and with the temptation of furthering social division and the temptation to retreat into private sphere, into prayer, and to abrogate our Christian responsibility. But neither of these extremes um, is going to help us contribute to our witness in the world. In this talk, I want to offer a middle way, an Aristotelian golden mean, guided by the central virtues of charity and courage, and rooted in such Catholic social teaching principles as the common good and human dignity. These principles provide a compass to guide us in civic virtue, and to remind us that each of us is responsible for contributing to the common good, and that each of us is responsible for those whom we're called to form our children, our students, and to help them learn how to practice civic virtue and contribute to the common good. When we say in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, we have agency in that prayer. We are not simply waiting for God to do something. It is up to us to apply the right principles in each moment of each day, in each interaction, whether in public or in private. When we see our nation's flag, when we practice our freedom in democratic societies, and when we engage in political discussions, we carry the responsibility of the common good in our hands. Through our voices, our body language, and through our screens. And our children and our students are watching us. They hear our comments, see our body language, and imbibe the television, radio, and social media outlets that often form the backdrop to civic life. What legacy are we leaving? And how do we prepare our children for civic virtue in such contentious times? Especially times that often seem hostile to Christian witness. When we talk about political culture, we have a tendency to think broadly. We talk about contentious or corrupt political leaders, gridlock legislatures, 
liberal versus conservative leanings of officials and justices. And we talk about media bias. This leads us to use global reductive language such as the system or to use superlatives such as all in a given party or all in a given role think in one singular way. When we point fingers at others' bad behavior, we often wring our hands and sometimes rage about how others are getting it wrong. But this tendency to go broad in our critiques can mask our personal responsibility and disempowers our agency. I want to emphasize this. By pointing at others, we lose sight of our personal responsibility, and we forget that we have the power to influence others, perhaps a small group, but our imprint is close and deep. How we influence others is our responsibility. In addition to the problem of pointing at others, we also have a tendency to reduce others to tidy boxes. We make assumptions based on a comment we heard or read on social media, other clues we interpret. We have scientific brains and we like to sort, organize, categorize, and ultimately create a container to hold all the information we associate with a person or a group. It makes us feel like we are in greater control too. But such reductive thinking diminishes each individual's human dignity. These assumptions we make about others also forms the root of prejudice. Often these assumptions and prejudices mask our fears. And fear is the enemy of charity and courage. We can each be culpable when we reduce our own complexity before others. Look at the signs on cars or in yards or on social media posts. Those nano sound bites that people use to signal what they stand for. Look at social media, where a disproportionate number of people, both young and older, get their news. I teach Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 in our first year upper school English class, and we address the essential question, why is reading essential to freedom in a democracy? Bradbury reveals what happens when a society stops reading and relies on sound bites and signage to reduce complex thinking to simple phrases. He was worried about the new invention of TV in 1953 and the danger of relying on images rather than substance and sound bites rather than reflective thinking. When we see the effects on social media, Bradbury's concerns seem even more prophetic. In addition, we are immersed in an emotionally charged media and comedy culture that keeps us high on sarcasm and contempt. The more clever, the cruel, the better. The more hard-hitting, the more celebrated. Arthur Brooks calls this the outrage industrial complex. And he documents studies that prove that these emotionally charged experiences hit us like surges of dopamine, and it's addictive. I also love a good laugh. I appreciate free speech. And I recognize that politicians are ready targets for satire. But sometimes I wonder if there isn't a secret middle school bully or bystander in too many of us, because it seems so easy to join in when others dehumanize our politicians and mock them without boundaries. People today have grown up with a steady diet of political satire on TV and radio, along with the clips and quips on social media that feed this echo chamber. If we can become numb to violence by constant exposure to violence on screens and in video games, can't we become numb to the psychological cruelty through such constant exposure? So generalizing the problem, putting others in boxes, getting dopamine hips by immersing ourselves in the culture of political contempt, these patterns can blind us to the ways we add to divisiveness in our societies. And ultimately, we know who the author of Divisions is. So what role are we playing in this culture? What behavior are we modeling? How are we affecting others around us? What does swallowing all of this poison do to our hearts? How are we forming our children and students? To reorient ourselves toward civic virtue requires developing the habits of right living that affirm our solidarity with our fellow man, informed by constant reminder 
that each person is created in the image and likeness of a loving God who is formed as in love and for love, in community and for eternity. What guides us in our witness in the world is love, infused by God's grace. As St. Paul elaborates in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, If I speak in the tongue of men and angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, then I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So to discern how to love in the midst of our current cultural and political challenges requires us to develop practical wisdom to help us refine our habits that promote civic virtue. Dr. Christensen of the Jubilee Center for Character Education in the University of Birmingham in the UK has established four criteria of practical wisdom. One, emotional regulation. To ensure that our emotions are attuned well-regulated and motivational and helping us identify and respond well to the right choice in a given situation. Two, constitutive awareness, that we recognize and name the goods that are in conflict in a moral dilemma. For example, I don't want to strain my relationship with my coworker or family member, but I feel this issue must be addressed. Three, developing a blueprint for a flourishing life. Over time, each person develops a vision of what we are aiming for in the aggregate of our lives, the ultimate good toward which we direct our lives. We get help from outside models, but our choices pave our pathways. Four, integrative agency. As we regulate our emotions, assess the goods in conflict, and assess what choices align with our blueprint for a flourishing life, We have to choose well, as well as reflect on our mistakes and recalibrate to make better choices the next time. I'm an English and history teacher at the Montrose School, and I serve as mentor to countless students over my teaching career. I'm also a mother of five daughters. While parents and teachers know that the work of helping form young people in character is our life's work, My studies through the Masters of Character Education program where Dr. Christensen teaches has deeply informed my experience and praxis. My research projects have focused on the role of relationships in contributing to adolescent formation in practical wisdom, which is the underlying thread that grounds this talk and forms my research obsession and my life's work. Helping students develop the habits of heart, mind, and character to advance in practical wisdom lies at the core of our school's mission in serving our students as teachers, mentors, coaches, and club leaders. The compass image reminds each Montrose student that life is an orienteering challenge. There's unfamiliar terrain to navigate, maps to decode, unexpected encounters to maneuver through, forks on the path that require hard choices, There are moments of triumph and of tears, times when our confidence surges and times when we recoil in doubt. There are times when we get lost and have to forge a new trail, times when we need to turn back and start over. While the end of the journey is not crystal clear until we get there, as we find our bearings, the canopy opens up and the path becomes clearer. No one takes this journey alone. 
parents and mentors accompany us all along the way? And are the saints and angels cheering and guiding us from behind the mist? Our compass sputters when we stumble, but it always aligns with true north if we hold it steadily before us. When I think of us, each of us navigating the rocky terrain of our current political culture, and especially our children and students, it's as if a traveling carnival has laid stakes and sullied our woodland pathway. Creepy clowns, screaming television screens, and carnival boots which sink our time with diversions and the promises of cheap prizes bar the path. And we're feeding on a carnival diet that is ruinous to our health. When it comes to politics, our expectations are often low. Rather than expect people to demonstrate their best humanity, we anticipate their worst, and sadly, we let ourselves join in. Rather than settle and align our emotions to the good, we let ourselves churn with anger, disgust, and frustration. Rather than see goods in conflict, we demonize those with whom we disagree and wash over the failings of those on our side. Rather than refine our blueprint for a flourishing society, we diminish our expectations and accept a nasty political culture. Rather than choose the good, we fall prey to our less charitable instincts. But we can do better, and here are some tips that can help, not only in our own practice, but in guiding our children and students. Step one, start with emotional awareness and empathy. Be patient. Let me tell you a humbling teaching moment when I did not start with emotional awareness. Turn back the clock to the 2016 presidential election in the U.S., where I prepared my AP Lang students to meet two days after that election. Emotions were churning everywhere, and I wanted to find a way to analyze the election results in a way that would activate frontal lobe reasoning and avoid emotional sinkholes. So I asked what I considered a fair-minded question. What arguments have been made for why people voted for President Trump that unify Americans, and which arguments divide Americans? My thinking was Rust Belt industrial decline, trade imbalances, general economic insecurity issues could unify Americans with some empathy, and that interest group political issues often left Americans divided. But as I turned from the whiteboard, I saw tears streaming down some girls' faces. <clears throat> Yet I forged on, hoping to raise the discussion toward analysis. After class, I received an email from a couple of girls saying that I had clearly voted for President Trump, and today I'd lost all fair-mindedness that I had demonstrated throughout our civics unit. I was shocked. I hadn't voted for the president, and I didn't think I'd changed my focus at all. Through lots of follow-up discussions, I finally realized I had not acknowledged their emotions. I had not empathized. By not engaging with their emotions, I had inadvertently fractured our relationship and injected distrust. Fortunately, through courageous conversations, we rebuilt that trust. Fast forward to the present. My AP Lang class is engaged in our civics unit amidst our current presidential election season. I've learned a lot over the last four years that I need to recognize non-judgmentally the emotions of my students first, give them time and space to settle those emotions before we can engage in rational reflection. Emotions are powerful, and you can't rush the timetable by pushing out facts and arguments. For facts and arguments feel like weapons shot at a vulnerable person when someone is emotionally charged. Lack of engagement and attunement with emotions fractures relationships and tears apart community. Step two, model openness and curiosity. Be patient. We need to facilitate others' voices by asking questions that demonstrate our openness to learn from them and use reflective language to make sure we've understood their views accurately. Aim to understand. Don't offer an opinion unless asked. When you do, start with common ground. For example, we both worry about racism in our country. 
I hear that you think the problem is X, and I've been thinking a lot about Y problem too. What do you think? <clears throat> Keep engaging by prompting with questions rather than shutting the door with a firm endpoint statement. Think of each discussion as a first discussion, not as a last chance discussion. Keep the door open for more conversation. Step three, keep the ultimate long-term values in view. Be patient. In any given conversation, we must affirm the other's inherent dignity. We need to strengthen our relationship with that person by affirming them through the care and courage we demonstrate through this exchange. Reflect as the discussion goes on. Is this a good time to share my views or is it better to wait? I call those Holy Spirit moments. Do I say something now, God, or keep my mouth shut? Remember that we are all creatures made in God's image and our primary task is to love. Leave each conversation knowing that the other person experienced only love from you in that exchange. Step four, respect human freedom and cultural diversity. Freedom is essential to our human dignity as creatures made in the image and likeness of a loving God. Freedom is messy, and the fact that each individual is free means that we can disagree. As individuals, we have a right to our conscience, and we have a responsibility to act on our convictions. But we also live amidst other free people, and we have to respect that they too have a right of conscience. We have a diverse culture, and we have to respect the diverse perspectives. This is essential to human dignity. Arthur Brooks reminds us that the competition of ideas is essential in a democracy. We should embrace rather than resist the competition of ideas. We should facilitate dialogue and not avoid shut down or shout over others. Divisions over core principles weave throughout U.S. history. What's new is not conflict in ideas, but a shift in how we view the concept of compromise. We used to admire compromise, the principal point of mediation between those with different views working toward incremental gains. Compromise does not signal a retreat from principle. Compromise is simply a pragmatic incremental step that models patience and respect for diverse views on what is good for our country. So welcome the exchange of ideas. Don't fear or demonize others' views. Embrace these conversations so that we can build relationships that enable us to find common ground and so that we can remain open to truth. For if the truth will set us free, we must allow the free exchange of ideas for all truths to surface. And the fullness of truth in our secular culture can be elusive. We often recognize truth in moments, in increments. We need to be humble and recognize that we can't claim omniscience about truth. We are not God and we have much to learn. Courage is when we do the good even when it is most difficult. Research shows that more of us avoid talking directly to those with whom we disagree and we avoid causing conflicts by openly talking about politics. And many of us tend to gossip in asides and often over screens. Yet we do harm in both extremes. We tend to open up with those we already assume agree with us. We listen to news stations who, whose bias confirms our own perspectives. Oh, but we don't call our news stations bias. We call the others news stations bias. We hide behind our silences and our screens. But is it courageous to just open up to those whose views you assume are affirming? Is it courageous to only engage in discussion with those with whom you already agree? Is it courageous to just love your friends? Or is real courage about loving your enemies? We are a social people made for community. The shared Latin root cum or with reminds us that community and communication are about gathering us together, wedding our bonds of connection. For communities to flourish, communication must be effective and it must be respectful. Communication must build up community. For people to flourish, they must feel respected. Their human dignity 
must be affirmed directly. We communicate human dignity and commute personal and community flourishing when we acknowledge others' emotions with empathy. When we demonstrate curiosity to empower their voices and to assure them that their values, their views hold value with us and we want to understand them fully. When we acknowledge that in political discourse there are always goods in competition, not simply good and bad people. When we acknowledge that we live in a diverse culture and we must accept humbly that we don't know it all and that we can learn from others. When we engage actively with whole persons in real time with our whole selves. And when we practice patience in these conversations to facilitate more conversations and to help build our civic culture one person at a time. So let's strive for greatness and civic virtue. Resist fixating on others as the problem. Resist putting others in boxes. Resist staying in silos. Engage in sincere and open conversations that are more focused on understanding than asserting, that affirm human dignity rather than team loyalty, that assume others' good intentions rather than cutting them down, rather than cutting them down with contempt. What is our Christian witness in the world? Are we modeling courage informed by charity? We are responsible for how we contribute to the common good, and we are responsible to help form those placed under our care. The current state of our culture in an election season is no exemption from our high calling as children of God. Thank you very much.